Bitcoin price action is historically very tied to global liquidity. Um, and so, so a bullish case for Bitcoin doesn't, has, doesn't, you don't need to be bullish on global liquidity, but it very much helps to be bullish on, on global liquidity. Um, and so again, next six months, I don't really have a firm view, but I do think that liquidity will be higher you know, 24 months from now than it is now. And therefore I expect Bitcoin to probably also be higher. I also look at various on-chain indicators. So for example, whenever there's a bear market in Bitcoin, fast money gets out and long-term holders tend to accumulate. And then when you have one of those big bull markets, so more demands coming in, but there's not a lot of new supply. And so you have to pry some of the supply out of the hands of longer-term holders. And that's somewhat measurable on-chain. And so prior bull markets, you might have had, for example, let's say 70% of coins haven't moved in a year. They're held by longer term holders. Uh, and that might go down to 60%, for example, in a bull market. It might it might drop by 10, 20%, depending on the, on the magnitude of the bull market. Um, and so far, that's only dropped by a handful of percent. Um, so most indicators would suggest that the bull market is probably still in its middling phase rather than its later phase. Um, assuming that global liquidity remains fairly decent. So I'm pretty bullish on Bitcoin with a, with a say, a 24-month period. And then I would also add that it, over a 10-year period, so for example, 20 plus trillion in, in treasuries coming to market, 2.5 trillion in, in gold at current prices and production rates coming to market, there's about $70 billion of gold, uh, of, of Bitcoin coming to market over the next 10 years at current prices. Uh, production rates are fixed. So the only thing, if more capital wants to flow into Bitcoin, obviously the price would have to go up pretty substantially. Um, and when we enter this kind of fourth turning fiscal dominance, you know, kind of sovereign debt crisis type of scenario, what a lot of governments do is they try to do capital controls. They try to clamp down Right. And what what do what you know keep a captive audience is is the phrase that I've seen in in research papers by Reinhardt and others. And Bitcoin is mobile capital. Um, it can flow across borders. You can memorize twelve words and bring your capital with you. Obviously, and we've already been seeing this. There's pushbacks against that capability. Governments don't particularly like the fact that bearer assets can move uh, portably. Right. So. There will be frictions along the way. There will be attempts to surveil it all, attempts to target it with special taxes. This is a jurisdictional by jurisdictional thing. Um, but I do think that that has a big role to play in that type of fiscal dominance world. Lynn's analysis highlights the behavior of Bitcoin in various market conditions, noting the pivotal role of long-term holders during bear markets and their gradual sell-off in bull markets. This cycle, as observable through on-chain indicators, gives us crucial insights into the supply dynamics that drive Bitcoin prices. According to Lin, given the upcoming fiscal pressures and the massive amounts of traditional assets like treasuries and gold entering the market, Bitcoin, with its fixed production rate, stands out as a potential hedge against fiscal instability. Fiscal dominance is when fiscal policy, like specifically large sovereign deficits and debts, um, constrains uh, the effectiveness or the options for central bankers for monetary policy. Um, so for a, a common thing, for example, if a government is running a very large deficit and the central bank is basically forced to monetize it because they can't let the sovereign bond market go illiquid or otherwise dysfunctional, then they're basically unable to fight inflation the way that they would prefer to. And so we've, we've seen kind of signs of that. And like fiscal dominance is not one of those things you're either in or out. There are shades of gray in the middle where you can kind of start getting into it. And, you know, the central bank hasn't lost all of their options, but their their opportunity set, their option set is diminished compared to what it would otherwise be. And so when people think of fighting inflation, they often think of Volcker, right, in the, in the 1970s and early 80s. But people have to keep in mind that the, the federal government back then had only 30 percent debt to GDP. Right. And most of the money creation at that time was, even though deficits were an issue, most of the money creation was not from deficits. It was from bank lending. There was a very high rate of bank lending happening in addition to real constraints on things like oil, for example. So you had a, you had a real world geopolitical issue, and then you had rapid bank lending money creation. And so his policy there was raise rates and slow down the rate of bank lending – 
Uh, and that had the effect of it did increase the fiscal deficit, but not very much because it's only 30 percent debt to GDP. The interest expense on the deficit was bigger, but the downward pressure he put on the private sector was larger than that. In addition, it hardened the dollar. And for uh, and this is kind of the, the brutal part of it. It would squeeze out, for example, Latin American countries. They had all this dollar dominated debt. It would put them into a depression. They would consume less oil. They had like a lost decade in oil consumption, and therefore it alleviates the price and the, and the supply constraints of th those limiting factors. So th that's basically the strategy that was employed back then. And he had a lot of flexibility because one, the presidents, you know, both Carter and um, Reagan were on board with that strategy. And two, he wasn't constrained by the fact that uh, you know, because public debt was pretty low. The problem is that, and Powell Powell faces a much harder challenge because although at the moment he has less geopolitical issues, right? So oil is still in a pretty comfortable range uh, for the most part. Uh, the challenge he faces is that federal debt is 120 percent debt to GDP, and so and the fiscal deficit, unlike the Volcker era, the fiscal deficit is larger than the sum of annual new bank loans and annual corporate bond issuance in the country. Uh, and so the majority of money creation, the majority of kind of how money is circulating, the fiscal side is like equal or bigger than the private side. And so when he raises interest rates, it does put downward pressure on the private sector. Uh, so bank loans slow down, corporate bond issuances slow down, um, companies and real estate operators run into some frictions and you know it kind of puts that downward pressure but then it also blows out the fiscal deficit at a four times bigger rate than it would do under Volcker uh, because that entire 120% debt to GDP debt load starts refinancing over time at those higher rates. And so that interest expense blows out by like a trillion dollars if those rates are kept high and for long enough. And that starts offsetting some of the downward force because for you know all that government deficit, including the interest expense, is someone else's income. And they, you know, it, it doesn't have a, as high a velocity to spend it as, say, a stimulus check does. Um, but that spending velocity is not zero. And mm -hmm. so the overall kind of tools become less effective. And I think that we've, we've kind of gone through this phase where in 2022, uh, the downward force they were putting was pretty effective. Uh, so it started to squeeze the private sector. We saw most signs of economic deceleration, if not outright recession. So, so purchasing managers indices rolling over, you know, kind of manufacturing activity rolling over, uh, GDP growth rolling over, um, you know, two two negative quarters in a row, even of, mm -hmm. of real GDP growth. All these kind of things were rolling over. But what we started to see by around either late 2022 or early 2023, depending on what metric you're looking at, we started to see that the interest expense was growing to such an extent and actually starting to stimulate certain things. And so some of those things started bottoming, even though the monetary side was still tight because the tight monetary policy was contributing to even looser fiscal policy. And so the deficit started to blow out, um, various economic indicators started to bottom. Uh, and then when they damaged the banking system, uh, instead of uh, just kind of following through with it. You know, if, if they wanted to fight inflation, they could have said, well, look, I mean, if banks blow up and if uninsured depositors lose money, well, then that destroys some of the money supply, right? They could have done that, but that would have been, that would have contributed to instability. It would have been unpopular. And so instead they blinked and they provided liquidity and, and solvency to the banking system. So they kind of prevented some of the harsher downside to the private sector while mm -hmm. still blowing out the fiscal uh, side. And so ever, especially ever since that kind of early 2023 period, we've been in this period where um, the, the fiscal deficits are a, a leading force in the economy, not, not the only force, but a leading force. Monetary policy is kind of at a back seat, and you have a wider than normal gap between the performance of different sectors because some sectors are more sensitive to interest rates, uh, commercial real estate being an obvious one because you have both high leverage and short durations and you have vacancy problems, for example, in office. So mm -hmm. that's like the that's like the poster child for something that's heavily negatively impacted. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, uh, you know, travel numbers, for example, flight numbers are at record highs. And so um, th there's a number of companies, that, you know, that are that are less overall 
interest rate sensitive and they're more fiscal sensitive. For example, a lot of these deficits are flowing to um, upper middle class people. They're the ones that have the assets. They're the ones getting higher interest rates on their assets and they're able to travel. They're able to go out to restaurants. They're able to do these things. Uh, in some ways, they're catching up on things they couldn't do uh, a few years ago because of the, the lockdowns and everything. And so some of those businesses are actually doing pretty well. So you have this really big gap um, between different sectors of the economy because of the wider than normal gap between loose fiscal and tight monetary. Lynn Alden illuminates this by comparing current economic conditions to those of the past, such as during the era of Paul Volcker in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Back then, despite high inflation, the federal government had relatively low debt levels, which allowed for aggressive interest rate hikes without massively impacting the fiscal balance. Fast forward to today, and the scenario is starkly different. With federal debt now exceeding 120% of GDP, central banks like the Federal Reserve face a precarious balancing act. Any attempt to combat inflation via higher interest rates can significantly worsen the fiscal deficit due to increased interest expenses on the national debt. This creates a feedback loop that may neutralize the intended tightening of monetary policy. This environment, where fiscal deficits become a significant economic driver, sets a complex stage for Bitcoin. As traditional economic levers become less effective, Bitcoin's non-sovereign, deflationary nature could become increasingly attractive to investors seeking refuge from potential currency devaluation and fiscal mismanagement. 